What is the value of a weapon? Hard to say, but I do know where it sits on this list of the top 100 basic D&D magic items. The plus two weapon is a powerful thing. Given out usually between levels 8 and 10, it signifies the second great leap in power. The plus two weapon ushers in the age when a D&D party, given a full rest, can pretty much take down anything in the monster manual. There are only a select few creatures that can stand up to a full D&D party at this point. And the plus two weapon is partially responsible for this. That plus two with bounded accuracy is the difference between a hit or a miss in many instances. And since a regular plus two weapon doesn't require an attunement slot, it still gives plenty of room for a D&D character to continue to build up their arsenal of powerful magical items. So because of its general versatility, its overall raw power, and a plus two item not requiring an attunement slot, it comes in here at spot number 70 on our list. And this nice item following it up at spot 69 is the plus one shield. Now, you might be asking, why is the plus one shield above the plus one armor? And why is it three spots above the plus one armor? Well, it's very simple. The plus one shield can be used with many more characters. A barbarian can rage while having a shield, but they can't rage with heavy armor. That barbarian can also use unarmored defense with a shield, but they can't use that unarmored defense, again, while wearing armor. If you're a dex based fighter and you want a higher AC, but you don't want disadvantage on your stealth checks, well, you're going to go with a shield. You gain access to more feats and abilities with a shield, like the shield master feat, or the interception fighting style, and overall the shield is just better. You can do so much more with the character if you have a plus one shield. Until the highest levels of D&D, the shield is just the superior option. And since a plus one shield is an uncommon item and a plus one piece of armor is a rare item, you're gonna be able to get this shield much earlier. So because of those reasons, the shield is coming in at number 69. But actually, I've kind of been lying to you because there is a plus one set of armor that does go above the shield. At number 68 is the Elven Chain. And the Elven Chain is above the plus one shield because again, it is so versatile. And it's versatile because it allows spellcasters to have armor. This chain shirt is a DC 14 armor class plus your dexterity modifier maximum of two. However, you are proficient with this armor even if you lack proficiency with medium armor. Inspired by the Lord of Rings mithril armor, this is great if your wizard, sorcerer, warlock, what have you, is really struggling to stay up during combat. Combine Elven Chain with something like the Shield spell, and you can easily get your AC up to 19 or above. And that's high enough to skirt many attacks. And because spellcasters have, on average, the lowest amount of health in the party, on average, dodging these attacks are going to be even more significant. The Elven Chain isn't useful for all D&D characters, but the amazing increase in power that it gives spellcasters that don't have proficiency in armor, well, that propels it to spot 68 on the list. And next up is an iconic item, the Dwarven Thrower, or really just Mjolnir from Norse mythology. This item is absolutely fantastic. It's a plus three bonus to attack and damage. It has the throne property. It does an extra 1d8 damage or 2d8 damage versus giants, and it flies back to your hand immediately after you throw it. I'm gonna be brief with this item. If you're a dwarf, you should absolutely get a Dwarven Thrower. It's gonna be one of the absolute best items you can get. Otherwise, you're kind of screwed, because the Dwarven Thrower requires attunement by a Dwarf. If the Dwarven Thrower didn't have that little tagline at the end, you'd be set. But since there's no guarantee that you'll be a Dwarf, the amount of times that you'll see the Dwarven Thrower is rare. And it especially sucks if your DM uses random loot tables and just happens to roll up a Dwarven Thrower when there are no dwarves in a party. I've had that happen to a party that I've played in and it wasn't great. Everyone was looking at this incredible plus three magic item that they couldn't really use. But if it was open to all races, this would definitely crack the top 20. But for right now, it's sitting at spot number 67 on the list. But next we're going to another instance of power creep. The Wand of the War Mage plus one is a simple uncommon magic item which allows a spellcaster to ignore half cover, but more importantly, allows them to add a plus one to their spell attack rolls. There are many spells that live and die based on their spell attack rolls. 
Eldritch Blast, Firebolt, Scorching Ray, heck, even Ice Knife has spell attack rolls attached to it. No matter what spellcaster you play, whether you be a bard or a wizard, you're probably going to have at least one spell over the course of playing your character that's going to have a spell attack roll. And since some of these spells with spell attack rolls have additional effects, Wand of the War Mage inherently grows in power. Giving spellcasters this little boost helps them tremendously, especially if there is something like a wildfire druid that adds extra die of damage to some of their spell attack rolls. Or if you're a warlock with Eldritch Blast invocations, whose entire character is built off of Eldritch Blast hitting a target. Wand of the War Mage comes in clutch in so many situations. Say you need to get a chill touch off to stop the healing of an enemy creature. That small, extra chance to hit has so many other implications throughout the entire combat. Wand of the War Mage is being placed so high because of the additional tacked on effects that spells usually have with their to hit rolls. It's not because spells are doing more damage than martial weapon, it's because of those added tacked on effects. Now if you have a sorcerer who's just casting Firebolt, then you're gonna mark this item way way down on the list and put it probably in the 90s. But if you have a player that knows what they're doing and is trying to apply status effects throughout the combat, then yeah, this shoots up in power with the aggregate. But let's talk about another powerful magic item at spot 65, the Scimitar of Speed. This very rare magic item is very simple. Not only is it a plus two weapon, but as a bonus action, you can make another melee attack with it. But why is this so good? Well, if you're a rogue with sneak attack and you miss that initial attack, you can bonus action attack again. That fail safe in case you miss that initial attack is very powerful. Missing your one attack a turn with a rogue can be devastating. So a plus two light finesse magic item is fantastic. Or let's look at a paladin. You might be thinking, what a paladin would never want this? Well, think again. If you're a paladin that is going full smite crazy, which would you rather want? A great sword where you can only make two attacks, or a scimitar where you can make three attacks. As a paladin who focuses on smites instead of casting spells, most of your damage is actually coming from those smites. So while you are losing 2d6 damage on your previous two attacks by not using a great sword, you're gaining an extra 2d8, 3d8, 4d8 damage because you're getting an extra attack that can potentially smite. Or let's say you miss one of those initial attacks. That bonus action gives you the opportunity to get back where you would have been damage-wise. I could go on and on and on how powerful getting this extra attack is. That's partially why I think of haste so highly. Pretty much any character that can do additional damage when they make a melee attack will want a scimitar of speed. At least if the bulk of their damage is coming from things other than the weapon die. Heck, I can probably argue that most barbarians would probably want a scimitar of speed rather than a plus two great axe. But that's a video for another day. Because of the overall effects though of getting that extra melee attack, the scimitar of speed comes in at spot 65. And now going from an item that allows you to attack everything in sight to an item that allows you to see everything in sight. At 64, it's the Robe of Eyes. This robe allows you to become the party's watchdog. It gives you advantage on perception checks that rely on sight, so when you're on guard duty, looking out, making sure no one sneaks up on the party, this item is coming in handy. It's also giving you dark vision, so if you're a human without dark vision, this item, again, is great. But this item also allows you to see invisible creatures and things in the ethereal plane. You never know when you might need this item, but when you do, when you fight a phase spider or a rakshasa, you can see them coming and alert the rest of the party. If you're playing a high wisdom character whose sole goal is to have a high passive perception and see everything, the robe of eyes is a must for your character. And because of that, it's coming in at spot 64 on this list. But next, we're coming to an item that, again, seems deceptively simple, but for reasons that we previously talked about, is incredibly powerful. This item at spot 63 is the rare Ring of Protection. The Ring of Protection does one thing and one thing well. It protects you, gives you a plus one to your AC and to all saving throws. Every way that the DM has of doing damage to you or affecting your character, you have a better shot in defending yourself. And I think you can guess the initial reason why this item is above the plus one shield or the plus one set of armor, because it's also adding to your saving throw. But it has an additional reason, and I would still put it above the plus one shield even if it didn't affect your saving throw. That's because it can stack 
with any other item. You can have a shield and you can have a set of armor and you can still have this item. You can be proficient with no armor and no shields and you can still have this item. This item works for literally every character and every single character should want the Ring of Protection. Because of bounded accuracy, that small plus one bonus can go so far. Really, there's not much to say with an item like this because the item ability really speaks for itself once you dig into the core mechanics and design of D&D 5th edition. And we've seen it time and time throughout this list. Those flat bonuses do so much more than a new dungeon master or player would initially believe. And it's one of the biggest reasons why new dungeon masters unbalance their parties unnecessarily, because they don't know the power of just a simple plus one. But now let's go from a simple plus one to a plus two because at spot 62 we have the bracers of archery at spot 62 we have again another simple but powerful item the bracers of archery give a plus two to damage rolls made with longbows and short bows but in addition anyone who's attuned to this item gains proficiency in longbows and short bows so what does this mean for the average character? Well, if you're a ranged fighter already, you want to pick up this item because of the boost to damage. And that flat boost is more powerful, again, than you would initially think. It takes that D8 damage die and essentially turns it into the equivalent of a D12 damage die, or really a D6 damage die, at least in terms of consistency. Because the less faces on a damage die, the more consistent that damage is. A D12 is very swingy, while a D4 is very solid. Those margins are very different. While you'll be able to deal a higher total damage with a D12, a D8 plus 2 is going to hit that central 6 a lot more consistently. You won't have the highest highs, but you won't have the lowest lows. You can count on a pretty reliable amount of damage. But we also have to take into account that first part of the item. You gain proficiency in the longbow and the shortbow. Classes like the rogue or the monk benefit heavily from gaining access to the longbow. They are usually dexterity-based fighters but don't have access to this additional ranged form of combat. Their natural dexterity pairs extremely well with the longbow, which is a dex weapon. So by giving them access to it plus an additional damage boost, it turns these classes into actually some of the better ranged damage dealers. A rogue with a longbow who uses the aim bonus action from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything can consistently do a high amount of damage from hundreds of feet away. Or you have a monk using that same longbow. And if you pair that with Sharpshooter and the ability to disengage as a bonus action an incredible amount of movement speed, well, you're just going to stay away from everything that could potentially damage you. And once you factor in deflect missiles, evasion, dodge action, man, you just become impossible to actually hit. I don't think that the monk is that mechanically powerful on its own, but the one time I saw a monk with the bracers of archery who went for a sniper build, I was honestly really impressed. It didn't deal the most damage in the world, but it also wasn't able to be hit. So it was an interesting trade-off. So because it helps all classes that want to fight with a longbow or a shortbow, and really increases the effectiveness of a select few classes, I'm putting the bracers of archery firmly at spot 62 on this list. And now at 61, we come to one simple fact. The ability to increase the ability score of your character by a flat amount, no matter what, is incredibly powerful in 5th edition. And if you're something like a barbarian or a fighter, well, why wouldn't you pick up the Gauntlets of Ogre Power? This item is somehow an uncommon magic item, and it sets your strength score to 19. Look, if you have your ability to set your strength score in the early game to 19, to late game stats, why wouldn't you? And let's factor in again, if you're going off of random loot tables, this item is going to pop up more often than a lot of other items on this list. And what are the consequences of getting an ability score so high so early? Well, if you don't need to pump strength anymore as a strength-based damage dealer, then you can go right along and start pumping constitution or wisdom or charisma instead. Really whatever stat you want. Not only does this item make your strength damage, your strength saving throws, and your strength ability checks better, but passively, it's going to increase another stat of your choice as well. Items like this have a ripple effect across your character. Look, it's items like these that really make me hesitate to give out just a free, uncommon magic item as a dungeon master. Because when I first started as a dungeon master, I used to say, at first level, just pick an uncommon magic item for your character. 
but as I've gone through 5th edition, I've begun to realize some of the most powerful magic items are uncommon. It is not safe to give out random uncommon magic items. Items like these here gauntlets are why I don't use random loot tables. Because oopsies, I've just given out a magic item that I've ranked above multiple very rare magic items. But at the end of the day, I think any d, &D player worth their salt would affirm that the Gauntlets of Ogre Power are incredibly powerful. If you're a strength-based character and you can get this item before 5th level, you're in great shape. And even getting this item after 5th level is a bargain. Say you're a monk and you're really not prioritizing strength, but you have a free tomb in slot, so why not? Why not become the party's muscle and stronger than 95% of the population just like that? This will without a doubt increase the strength of your D&D character in some way, shape, or form, as long as your strength doesn't exceed 19. But there are actually easier ways to increase the strength of your D&D character, and if you want to learn how, check out this video right here. In my opinion, it's got some pretty good tips, and if you're enjoying this series, consider subscribing. And thank you for entering the dungeon!